Uh, so hello, my name's Justin Eisen. I'm a software engineer for Microsoft, uh, formerly Wonderless. Um, so I work on the Wonderless app. And today I'm going to talk to you about getting started with developing or building your own device grid and getting started for Android and iOS. So the challenge. We have all of these, and how will you test all of them? And each one of these cases. So you you have you have these apps, but you want to test on different locales and languages. You want to test all the different OS versions your app supports. Uh, validate every different resolution of different applications or different devices, and different screen sizes like phones, tablets, phablets, etc. And all the different manufacturers that come. So you could try the manual single-threaded approach. It's not recommended. Or the manual multi-threaded approach. Also not recommended. Though this guy doesn't seem to mind. Still not recommended. Could hire an army of zombie testers. Definitely not recommended. So what options do we have? Automation, of course. That's what, why we're all here. But how, why, and where? So you have a, you can run automated, but you want to run it single-threaded. You might end up like this guy waiting for the test to finish. So not recommended. Parallelization. We have a happy BFF forever, so I get branded happy on it. Does that make it work? So first we'll talk about the cloud as an option, uh, the pros and cons. You can send your test to the cloud and we'll talk about why. So you have the pros. So it is the present and the future of automated testing. Um, just like everything for our server architectures are going to AWS, Azure, et cetera, um, so will our tests, and they are headed that way in the foreseeable future, everything will be run in the cloud. Um, very rarely, I can imagine, things will be run locally. Uh, you have ease of setup and integration. You don't have to do any of that. It's all done for you. All you have to do is send your tests to these services. You don't have to buy all the machines and all the devices to uh, set these up. And some services actually provide you excellent analytics and reporting. Um, you could get um, good CPU usage, feedback, uh, memory usage when your app runs, and they give you all this information. Um, some even give you like where it spikes at and screenshots of when it occurs. Um, some test servers actually integrate very well with uh, other cloud CI services like Travis CI. So you could actually never ever see your app. You just build your app locally on your machine, uh, commit it, goes to Travis, tra builds in Travis, then runs tests either on Travis or another CI test service system. Um, you also expose your app to a much larger range of devices than operating systems, which you wouldn't have locally. So the cons. So the problem sometimes with these cloud services, especially remote services, is it's sometimes very difficult to de determine where the problem lies if you run into an issue. Is it a network problem? Is it a latency issue? And also outages can occur, just like we've seen here. When the power goes out, they can occur in these CI, or these uh, cloud services too. Uh, they could introduce bugs in their software. Um, you know, we're all in the software business and it, you know, it happens. Um, and they're not immune to it. So they may um, introduce a bug and you can't run your test, so then you're blocked until um, they fix this bug. Or they're acquired by another company and then shut down. Um, a couple years, years ago, I used a cloud service and was just getting started to use them and everything was going great. And then they send an email. They're like, oh, great news. We've been acquired by so-and-so. And then a month later, they're like, bad news. We're shutting down. <laughs> so, so you put a lot of effort into something you know, specific to their, their service. And then you're, 
kind of left in the dark. And then costs can be significant, um, especially if you're running on every commit. Um, they could add up. So here's just to name a few cloud services. This is not all, this is just the, from the top of my head. So the grid. So if you're going to do this yourself, we'll go through the pros and cons of that. So the pros is you uh, can run it unlimited. You don't have to worry about the cost. It's all, uh, it's all local. I guess just power consumption is the only thing. Um, you're also not handcuffed to the, the test services 24-7 availability. So if their service is down and you're trying to make a build but you have to wait for your test to finish and you can't do make the build because your test can't run, then you're kind of stuck. So you can eliminate that. Uh, you have all your data locally to debug. So instead of just having half the picture when you're sending to a cloud services, you have the full picture. You could see um, everything your device is doing, everything that's happening in your network, and you could grab that information and debug. Uh, you also have full access to every connected device via ADB or instruments. Uh, you don't generally run into latency issues unless you maybe have a remote hosted network and you have your server on another network in your private network, but maybe you shouldn't do that if that's the case. Uh, so you don't also um, expose your app um, or sensitive data to the cloud. So you may work for a bank or you may work for a government agency and you um, or just a very private company that doesn't want their app um, outside their building or their network. And same for their data. You know, maybe it's a health insurance company or health, or just a health company and they don't want any chance of their data being um, caught traffic between you and the cloud service. So you shouldn't run into that problem. The cons. So depending on what your bindings are, it could be difficult sometimes finding the documentation of how to set this up. You know, being in the Selenium and Appium community, we all know that they support many different languages. And some, some bindings have better examples than others based on their popularity. Um, just like anything you undertake, it takes a lot of time to smooth and get things uh, running like a weld oil machine. Um, you just run into a lot of gotchas and things along the way as you set this up that you didn't think about. Um, but you, you also won't, so another con is you won't be able to expose your app to a large range of devices and operating systems, unless, of course, you go and buy them all yourself. Then you also have to maintain the whole setup. So anytime there's an update on your, on your server, um, update on the devices, you need to downgrade the devices, or devices having an issue, or your servers having an issue that's running your CI, of course, then you have to go and maintain, debug, and fix this all yourself. And then devices could be a real, real pain. Um, and I'll cover this a little bit later. So what I'll demo, show you how to get all your connected devices programmatically, uh, launching your grid hub and Appium nodes programmatically, capturing screenshots, logs, video for reporting, running single-threaded, running test distributed, and when I say distributed, meaning each device is going to get its own test, so the test, the whole test suite completes faster, and then running in parallel, and parallel it's when all the devices run all the tests. And then also say, we'll show you how you can leverage cloud services such as Soft Labs, where it could be Browser Stack or Xamarin or whatever, um, where you may want to use um, at times a cloud service. Um, but you don't want to send your whole entire test suite to this cloud service. You just want to send selected tests. So like say you have a test to log in or create an account. Well, sure, you want to you want to make sure that works. Um, and you probably want to make sure it works on like all the popular like Samsung devices. Well, you could do that. You could send send selected tests to a cloud service to va validate um, these conditions. And then we'll generate a layer report with all the above metadata um, that I talked about and attach it. And for those of you that don't know Allure, Allure is an open source um, reporting framework that's cross-platform. Um, it's really good. It's really, really nice reporting uh, framework. 
And then I'll show you the setup I have at my work. So let's briefly look at the code. Hopefully you can see that. Um, I don't think I could. Have. Um, so I'll just say it's what I'm going to show you, the demo is in Ruby. Um, I don't know how many Ruby developers are here, but the concepts I'm going to go over are you can apply to your language or your bindings. So essentially what I have to do for Ruby, you'll have to do it for Java or C Sharp, whatever language you use. Um, so here I got methods that I capture all the device data, um, like I get the OS version, manufacturer, model, and SDK. And I put it all into an array and assign it a variable that I'll use later. Then I also assign it a thread value. And the key here, the thread value is important because when our processes run and get split off into separate processes, um, the library I use returns, gives me an environment variable saying, hey, you're on process one and you're on process two. So then I match the device to that process and that's how I know where which device is running on which process. Um, so here's just a sample JSON um, of, the, uh, of a generator report that I grabbed from the captured devices. And then we have our node config me method. So any, if, whenever you want to scale, if you, if you are going to scale and you go to parallelization, you have to generate these on the fly. There's no way, um, and I guess you could do these manually, but you'll go, go really slow. But it makes more sense to do it at program time or programmatically. So here's an example of a node config that was generated based on the device that I had connected. Um, for those of you that don't, doesn't know what a node config is, node config is tells the node that then connects to the Appium hub, or the Selenium hub, um, what its specs are and what it should do when it receives a uh, test request. And then we have an Appium server. So the same thing for the, the node config, we want to spawn and generate or start a new Appium server in the background um, instantly. And the nice thing about the Appium server is the wonderful and nice um, Appium developers baked a node into it. So all you have to do is then pass the argument of a node config with your um, config file. And then finally we have our, our hub and Appium server methods. Um, I guess just the key thing to take from this is um, we need to then tell our parallel library like how many processes it should run. So basically what we do here is then we just get, we assign a thread variable based on how many devices are connected to the machine. And we pass it on and we'll use that in a little bit. And then we have our ADB helper methods. Um, so Android, you can video record on real devices, um, which is important. I think video is, if there's anything that you should attach to a report, it should be video. Um, it says a million words. You could have all the log data, um, but it really it's, it's almost impossible sometimes to def decipher or debug what's going on, but a video tells you exactly what's happening. So the nice thing you can do with Android, and then you also want to get your uh, log information from the device. Then we got our spec helper methods. Um, so spec helper is just a, it's a thing for Ruby for our spec to do your, for your tear up and tear down um, processes. And the key thing to take from this is um, circling back to what I said before is we take and parse the array that the JSON or the devices that we capture before we start. Because at this point, this is already split off into a separate process. And the same file is actually in another process. So now we need to know which uh, device to connect it to. So here's just another quick tear up and tear down of what we've already just shown. Um, here we also want to get the UDID, because now we need to get the UDID to um, access ADB commands. Um, and also, I'll show you in a second, another reason. Um, so before each test, it, we start the video in LogCat, and then at the end we stop. So we only want the test, or at least myself, my opinion is, you should only want the video and the LogCat information for what's happening in that test. 
you don't want to capture the entire log of like what happened before the test started or even after. You just want the specific area in between. Same thing for video. And then here comes the you did example, uh, or why we get the environment variable. So we assign it to the, the description, which then will get um, put into the test report. But if I didn't have this you did, and we're running in parallel, we're running on multiple devices, um, I would get a report saying add node scenario failed, but I don't know which device it failed on. So Android, here's our setup for Android. So you know, I would recommend if you have a device that covers all these different SDK levels, you should download them. Um, if you have an Intel-based computer, you should al also get the Haxum Accelerator. It's, uh, the Android emulator, studio emulators are impossible to use without them. And then you want to generate a uh, uh, emulator for each one of those SDK levels. And here we'll just run through an example of a single-threaded test. should be the longest video by far. But it was, it's more to show you how painful and how slow it is. OK, it's done. It took, uh, still, yep, 48 seconds in total. Way too long. All right, so distributed. So obviously distributed the test um, to separate devices is gonna be the fastest approach. So. Sorry? Uh, you, uh, no, you can't, but you, you can sort of, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So. Um, sorry, and so distributed, um, we are gonna uh, run each test on each device, or split out the test and run on, um, on each device. So in our example, we only have two tests, so we only need two devices, so they're here. Uh, one's emulator on the right, or on the left, uh, device is screencasted on the right. It's done. So our runtime went from 48 seconds to 27 seconds, so almost cut in half. And here I'll just show you quickly our reports that we generate. So we went over what we could capture, and now we're going to take them and apply, and you can see why it's powerful to have all this information. So it's fast. I didn't touch anything, but you can if you want. actually you could attach whatever you want, but um, go ahead, you attach the Appium log, the hub log, log cat, screen, take a screenshot, and then your video, which is um, key. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this, so this video right now is what, it came from the report. Um, there, you can probably see it back here. So yeah, so the video, then I click video, and then it opens the video. Uh, this reporting framework? Yes. Yeah, so it actually, um, I think they almost do every single popular language. So, yeah. Em embedding the video to? Um, yeah, so you're, you, uh, you attach the video itself, and then it, exactly, 
yeah, that will attach it to the report when it generates, and then it puts it into it. So it essentially is just creating a um, big HTML um, generator report, and it actually has its own server. So it spawns up its own um, HTML server, and it runs and opens a report. So uh, you don't, it doesn't need to be, I think, um, Android by default, it's MP4. There might be a way to specify another format, but I think that's just that's what you get. Um, but I think MV4 should run on Windows and um, doesn't. So <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, so we have gone from our distributed to our parallel test example. So in this example. Um, comes back to play for all our different SDK levels. We want to make sure that our app runs um, against all these different uh, versions. So here I have five emulators, and then the bottom right is a uh, screencasted um, device. I have one more. This one's a little long, and I'll skip past it. But the spoiler alert is the top right emulator there will crash, which is good. I didn't intend it for this uh, demo, but it crashed on me, but we'll see why it's good. Yeah, so they're all running the same tests, but they're not, all right, so I'll take that back. They, all, they will all run the same tests, but they're not running the same tests at the same time. Uh, yeah, so I just took the devices and then I screencasted a certain area on the screen, or recorded an area. So, um, so it, I go back to saying that they're not running the same test at the same time because um, I think another good practice to do for testing is running your, um, have a, a flag, which probably most test frameworks has, is to randomize your test order. And this will help uh, reduce test flakiness cause, or help you stop um, having one test rely on another test, and just, it helps you build better tests, in my opinion. Okay, so it crashed. I should take the word for it. Should have really left. There, crashed. So now we have our low report. Same tests fail as they did for our distributed and single approach. Um, again, like I was saying, if I didn't put that um, you did, in the, the test uh, title, I would just see all these red, and I'd be like, all right, well, what happened? Why did this test fail? Or why did it pass in this test, and why did it fail in this one? By, but, but by passing the UDID, now I know it's this device versus this device there. So we'll just go, I think this is just going to go straight to the broken one. And in this case, it's broken because um, there was no, there was never an assertion. It just never was able to go to the next step. So it's actually it's classified as a broken test and not a failure. So we got our hub log, Appium log. They're not going to actually help us in this case. Um, but the logcat is where it's key. The nice thing about attaching the logcat is now um, you can search for the exception, the stack trace that occurred, um, and then you could either attach the link of this report to the bug report that you signed to the developer, or just grab all these um, attachments and then put them into an email or into the bug report, and then he has all the information that he needs to hopefully debug the problem. So that's what I think was the problem. I didn't actually look into it myself, why it crashed. Um, but we also have the specs to recapture So like I was saying, you um, may come a time where you want to distribute your tests and put them on a cloud service um, and only certain scenarios. And here, I'll just briefly show you it's, it's possible. So anything you have tagged as a sauce or um, test object or browser stack or whatever you want to name it, you can name it cloud and then it will run onto your cloud service.
So the same. So it went went to sauce, it ran, and then it failed, just like it did locally. And we can still then generate a report. And okay, sorry, I was waiting for it to finish, but I guess it does finish. Um, so the nice thing is, at least with Sauce Labs, is you and um, Allure is you could then go use an API and download all your test assets. And if you want to, you could then attach them into your report. So you're not um, just because you're not running it locally, you could still get this information. You could download the video that ran there and um, their log hat information and whatever other logs they had. You could download them locally and then attach them to your report. And then I this link this thing went away. Uh, yeah, the link at the bottom. I made a, an example of how you can do that. So iOS. Close that up for so iOS um, real devices only. You can't do this with can't do it technically with simulators, but that's quickly changing. Um, so what you have to do if you want to do if you're going to use real devices, you have to enable developer mode on your device. And you have to pair your device to your machine, just like you do with Android. Um, enable UI automation in the developer menu. Um, and then ideally, you'd want to connect every OS version of that your app supports. Um, but iOS is generally pretty good with backwards compatibility than um, some Android. So here, uh, here's the iOS test running in parallel. So these are all real devices. They're just screencasted using the Reflector app. Um, iOS runs pretty slowly compared to Android. It's, it's actually pretty painful slow. Um, hopefully that will improve in the future. It's the same machine. You could run them in parallel if they're real devices connected to the same machine. Well, they don't have to technically be the same machine, but you could run one uh, simulator on a Mac device, but you could connect multiple devices. To so real, de yes, you can, and this is what this is doing now. Yeah. And that's done. So same, uh, we could generate the report for iOS as we did for Android. Um, here, like I was doing with the UDID, it's probably not as nice looking as it is as Android because they're a lot smaller. Um, so you don't have to use the UDID, you can actually use the device name. So in this case, it would be validate alerts pop up, Justin's iPhone 6. Um, but just some type of identifier is nice to have so you know exactly what device it is when it or if you're just looking at the overall test report but not actually seeing the failure itself. Um, so you notice here we attach all the same stuff except video. Um, iOS, you can record video on it. It's, it's a little bit more difficult. There was an open source project that was doing this, um, but it's since non, not being maintained anymore. So if anybody knows of a solution how you can video record that, um, that's a CLI that could be used on any um, uh, framework. Please come talk to me after. I'd be interested to hear it. Uh, so in, here's our, um, I'm going to show you our Wonderless example. So for those of you that don't know what Wonderless is, it's a uh, task management app, um, a to-do to -do list basically. Um, helps organize your day or week or year, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to accomplish. So here are the specs for it. So we use a uh, Mac Pro 3.5 gigahertz six core machine. So we could spawn it off to, uh, or we could get six processes out of that. And then 32 gigs of RAM. Um, we have, we use two nine port uh, USB hubs. One's for Android, one's for iOS. And then we have a programmable power strip, um, which I'll talk about this a little bit more, but um, the nice thing about it is you can reboot anything that you have connected to it. Like we reuse it to reboot our USB hubs, our router, and Mac all remotely. 
Dollhouse uh, also has an embedded web service. So when you're, if you're on the network, you can access it and control the machine if you need to. Then we also have a, we use this Blink One uh, programmable USB light to um, display our CI, CI status. So when the app's building, when the tests are running, if the tests pass or the tests fail, we, we know by just looking at the machine, you know, what, what the state is. Uh, and then we use Jenkins to build everything. Here's a video demo of it running. And these are all running distributed So going back to the emulators, um, we also run these on emulators too. We run these for our smoke tests. Um, so we want to know exactly if, we want to know right away if the, the app is uh, working. So as soon as it's committed, these spawn the, the emulator startup and the test run on each of these. These, these two are all running distributed as well. Okay. So going back to our reporting, like we were showing earlier, uh, you could have the best test suite in the world, you could have the best code, but if you're not getting good report data, it's worthless. Um, so reporting, I think, is almost as or more important than your actual tests themselves. So here we could get this, the stack trace of the error that it happens. Here in this case, I think, uh, yeah, the page wasn't displayed. It was looking for a task page. Um, we got the admin log, and actually on these, I captured the standard outs. So anything that's printed to the standard out, I, I put it into a file and then attach it. Um, and then I have a video here or you see even screenshots. So that's why I say, like in this case, I have a screenshot, the screenshot happened, ha happened at the end of the test, but it didn't tell me anything. Like I just look at the screenshot and I'm like, so if I had a screenshot and had logs, it would never tell me anything, but this video told me what happened. I was expecting to go to the task page, but it didn't. It skipped a page and went to another page, so it failed. So the log cat didn't, didn't throw, an app didn't throw an error, it just didn't do what it was supposed to do. Sorry. Oh. No. Um, so the other nice thing is, because Lura is so flexible to whatever you can attach, it's also nice to get the, the server traffic if you can. Um, so with like Logcat, you already get the traffic that's occurring from the app to your service, to your server. Um, but it's also nice if you have access to the server, get what its traffic is and then bring it back so you could actually combine the two and see what the app's sending, what it's receiving, what the app server is receiving and um, sending out. And then you don't see it here, but now we also um, attach, uh, for Android, we attach the, um, the app's database files. So in, with the emulator, you could do this because you have access to where um, it stores its files, but you have to root the phone if you um, go where um, Android put places the files. And the database files are sometimes key to help developers because, like, even with the reporting, you got a stack trace. But if the developer could see what the local database of the device is doing for the app itself, then they could see errors there as well. So, whatever you could actually possibly attach, I recommend to do it. Um, I think too too much data is better than too less. So, some challenges that I face with the setup. So ADB disconnects. Um, 
this one was very annoying because like one minute the device is connected to ADB, uh, next minute the device is not connected, and we have no clue why. It just is not uh, on the it's not connected on the PC. Um, but you know, there's like thousands and thousands of pages of Stack Overflow or other pages of people having the same problem. The number one problem is, or the number one solution is like, oh, just unplug the device, plug it back in, and it reconnects. But sure, sure, if you want to, <laughs> if you're doing it manually, but uh, how do you do this at a scale and you're running a, a mobile grid? So going back to the pr programmable power strip, is at the beginning of every uh, test run, um, it uh, cycles the USB hubs, which essentially is unplugging and plugging <coughs> devices back in. Um, there's probably a more elegant solution to this, but this actually took me 10 minutes and it works and it runs every time. Uh, another problem that I've had is Wi-Fi issues. Um, the device is connected to the Wi-Fi and it's fine and then like 30 minutes later it's not connected or it's still connected to the router but you have the explanation mark and it can't access the internet. That's very frustrating. Um, so I went through several um, different attempts to fix it, but the one thing that I found that fixed it was I just toggle airplane mode on and toggle it back off, um, or turn it, yeah, turn it on, turn it off before every test run, and that re refreshes your Wi-Fi connection. Um, other pro solutions that I tried, um, you could reverse USB tether your device. Um, which then will share the internet connection from your from your computer to the phone, but it requ requires routing, and I didn't want to do that for my mobile devices that weren't mine. Um, I don't think my employer would have appreciated that I did that, um, so I didn't go that approach. You could use multiple routers on different broadcasting channels. Is what somebody mentioned. Somebody said that. When you have one router with the same, they're all the same broadcasts, it, they could interfere with each other, but this solution actually didn't uh, seem to, it maybe helped a little, but not much. Uh, then you have alternate alternatives to real devices. Uh, our Android Studio emulators that I showed you before. I can't video record, although I have open source a tool to do this. Um, you're free to use it if you want. Uh, right now, it's just for Mac and Linux machines, uh, but I will have an update for Windows shortly. Uh, also, going back to what I was saying before, a nice thing about emulators is you have full access to the database files that your app writes to if it creates a database. So you can capture all this information, put it into your report, and it's, it's, actually, it's more information the developer needs to help debug whatever problem they're facing. Uh, emulators can use a lot of memory if you have um, a lot running. As you saw when I had the um, page of emulators, I think there was seven or eight, and that was starting to kind of max out, and that, that was a you know 32 gig RAM, 3.5 gigahertz machine, so. so. With, you can. And actually, that might be next. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so the closest thing I found to gen or to real devices is Jenny Motion emulators. Um, they're really good. And it has video recording, but no way to uh, programmatically start the record with like an API or CLI. At least last I checked, I haven't, um, once I found my solution, I hadn't gone back to look into using them. Um, so then, again, going back to devices could be a real pain is basically what I've said above, but also this is you just have erratic devices that even from the same manufacturer, same model, one would act very nice to you and the other one just would be erratic. I'd get random reboots on some, some devices. Some won't even connect to ADB no matter what, even though it says you're paired to the machine and just can't see, your machine can't see the device. Um, I've had devices that just like spit out crazy text. So if you're um, running a test and you enter a string and you want to validate that a string appears correctly on the 
on the device. It will have like a couple weird characters mixed in with the, the string that will then fail your assertion. So. And then I've had battery issues. Like I've had devices that even though they're connected to power, they just uh, shut down. They can't stay powered. Right? And then a lot of devices today, you can't replace the battery. So you have to take it back. So some things in the future to be excited about. Um, at the Portland Selenium conference back in September, they, uh, uh, Facebook mentioned the XC, XC tool that they're building for the X, Xcode build. Um, it's a nice, it has a lot of nice uh, helper uh, methods in it. And then they also are building, or they, they have built um, the web driver agent to do parallel simulator, iOS simulators, um, all on the same machine. It's pretty nice. And then currently, I Iowa, or Appium is um, developing and building the framework around the XC unit, UI unit tests um, that Apple has just introduced this last year. And that eventually will get integrated into versions of Appium in the future. And then oh, the Open SDF. This is actually a pretty cool thing. Um, if you guys have ever used some of the cloud services like Perfecto Mobile or test object, you can actually go onto the web browser, you can click on the, the device, um, you can install software, or you can play around in the browser, do whatever you want with it. So this is an open source uh, tool that actually you could, if you had your own internal mobile lab, you could actually do that and see all your mobile devices internally on the web page and control them. And then lastly, since I work for Microsoft, I had to say this because I'm actually pretty excited about it, is uh, the Windows application driver. So Windows, uh, Microsoft is building a open source tool to use an Appium like, or use Appium to automate your Windows apps, your Windows um, universal apps. So in theory, you'll be able to automate a script for Windows for your desktop app, your Windows phone, Xbox, uh, whatever falls under the universal uh, one app. The SDF, yeah, it's it's just Android now. I think they uh, in their um, pipeline to do things. I think they they mentioned iOS, but yeah, it's just Android now. Uh, sure, I mean you can wrap it around what you do. Um, yeah, it's I mean it doesn't have anything built into it. Uh, the question was, can you use it um, as part of your Appium execution? Uh, you would have to build that part, but you, in theory, yeah, you could. You could have it, and devices that are being used for tests would be the only ones that are showed on the web page. Or, um, yeah, so it's, it's possible. And this guy's still waiting. So thank you. So. Oh, one, one second. I was just going to say, so this link here is everything I showed you, um, all the code. Um, it's a working mobile uh, grid, basically. So you could use it. If you have any problems, then just email me. So, sure. Oh, so re remote connect. Uh, yeah, you would just, I haven't, I've never tried it myself, but I, I guess in theory you should be able to, um, if you already have the connection to those machine or to those devices, you would just spawn up a node with saying, I'm using this device, connect to that machine, and it, it would should know, and it should be able to map to those devices. Sorry, I missed that last part. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you should be able to, so if you have an ADB connection connected to a device, for it, whether it's on a VM, um, if you have a central place like your master uh, PC or where, wherever it's gonna run from, as long as it 
gain a connection, you could then generate a, um, get the information about that device and then gen generate a node config. So yeah, it sh should be possible. I, I think people do this as well. I mean, I've heard people do it, yeah, so. Yeah, so that is a uh, hard SDK limit that Android's put in. Not sure why. Uh, maybe because they want to just worry about restriction uh, or worry about memory space. Uh, but actually, the the solution that I came up for Android emulator recording actually will fix that too. It uh, does um, it loops through and creates it merges the two files, so you could actually go past the 180 seconds. So. Pump up the execution time drastically. Oh, sorry. Yeah, can you repeat it? Because there's a lot of noise. I didn't. Uh, uh, my question was specific to device challenges, uh, like switching to the airplane mode before e each and every test execution. Uh, don't you think it's it's very much overhead and uh, will bump up the execution time drastically? It could. You should do it in parallel. Um, I didn't mention that, uh, but yeah, you should um, do. If you're going to do anything like that across the devices, you should do it all in separate threads in parallel. It, it should roughly take you, what, 10, 10, 15 seconds. So yeah, you have a little bit of this um, setup time that you have to count for, but it's it's better than the alternative of the test failing because it can't get internet. So, so how long it is taking for you, your test cases, like around 1,000 test cases, the execution time for both Android and iOS? Um, well, I don't have that many tests. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't remember how many we have, but single threaded, like single process, it took anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes. Um, we don't have that many tests. Uh, we're big believers on like testing core features, or at least I am testing the core and not try to put too much into your um, test suite. Um, so f from single, it, went from 35 to 45 to when we were running distributed to about five minutes, five, six minutes. So okay. you get everything that it was doing in like a fraction of the time. So okay, thanks. Sorry. Sort of. Yeah, it depends on your machine. So the machine we use is the six core, so 12 process. So you could do 12 devices theoretically. You can go a little bit above, uh, but then you'll start running into some weird um, uh, weird behavior of these like separate processes that maybe shouldn't be running. I don't, I don't know, but yeah. I, I, I tend to try to keep it to what how many uh, cores you have. There are how many processes you, your computer can handle. So. Thank you. Uh, there was a question back there, I think. Or oh, I guess we're out of time. No. Right. Uh, one one question. Sure. Yeah. How about uh, we are talking about Logcat uh, for logs? It is only for Android. How about iOS? Yes. Um, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so my example, we're very brief on iOS, but you can. There's a. Um, the iDevice lib um, is an open source, I think it's called iDevice lib, something like that. It's an op open source library that has a bunch of different tools that you could do to access your iOS device. Um, and one is you could capture the console data of the device, um, amongst other things. Uh, part of the library is iDevice installer, which Appium uses to install the device, or install the app onto the device. But there's a bunch of other methods in that as well. So I'd recommend taking a look at that and seeing what you could do, but yeah, one is grabbing the console. So. Okay, thank you. So, you're welcome. All right, well, thank you, everyone. So.